Who says there's not much to see in the late winter garden? Today we visit a 300 acre masterpiece and learn how you can have color even during the most difficult seasons. You won't want to miss it, so stay tuned as we Garden Smart from Georgia. Beautiful, colorful songbirds. At Pennington, we believe in helping wild birds not only survive, but thrive. Pennington Ultra Premium Wild Bird Feed has 100% real fruits, nuts, seeds, and grains. Bring the outdoors into your everyday life. Bass Pro Shops can outfit all your adventures, even those in your backyard. Bass Pro Shops, your adventure starts here. Jaguar F-Pace. For years, Garden Smart has been traveling the country visiting beautiful gardens, and it's very rare that we find a new garden, certainly not one as impressive as Gibbs Gardens. Jim Gibbs traveled the world viewing gardens of every style and spent six long years looking for just the perfect location. What he wanted was land with rolling topography and plenty of water to build streams and ponds and waterfalls on. What he found were 292 perfect acres. On that acreage, he built 16 gardens, three water features, and a manor house. It was very important to Jim that he found just the right plant. He wanted plants that were unique and looked mature. He would even go so far as to knock on people's doors and ask them if he could buy the plants that were in their front yard. Surprisingly, in most cases, they sold him the plant. Jim Gibbs was also the founder of Gibbs Landscape Company in Atlanta, and he's had a lifelong passion for plants that he now shares with us in Gibbs Gardens. In his own words, Passing down seeds and plants from generation to generation provides the kind of love that only a gardener understands. Jim, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Jim, tell me, what sparked your interest in gardening? To me, gardening is in the genes. Most people, if you look back, it's somewhere in their genes. For me, it was my grandmothers were both avid gardeners. My mother was an avid gardener. Her four sisters were all avid gardeners, so I listened to them talk about gardening and I actually had hands-on experience of actually doing the gardening. And they always told me when you have your own house and you have your own property, you're going to really appreciate a garden a lot more. I realized later that that's true. When everybody has their own little plot of land and they can get out there and garden, they enjoy it a lot more. So a lot of your education was hands-on experience, but then do you also have formal training in horticulture? I do. I actually uh, graduated from the University of Georgia. I have a major in horticulture with a minor in landscape architecture. And while I was studying uh, landscape architecture, I decided I wanted to uh, start a design build company in Atlanta. I knew then that I needed not only the three years of landscape architecture that I had, but I needed to get a BS degree in horticulture so I knew more about the plants and how they grew and what plants to select. So that's, that's the formal education. Well, today we're going to visit your opus, your masterpiece, Gibbs Garden. I can't wait to tour it. Thank you. Look forward to showing it to you. Thanks.
Jim, why did you select this site to build your garden on? In 1973, I knew that I wanted to build a world-class garden. But I knew that, first of all, I had to come up with a criteria for searching for land. Mm -hmm. I knew that I needed an abundance of water. I needed a mature forest setting. I wanted to make sure that we had rolling topography to feature all the plant material. I wanted to make sure that we were located between 400 and 575. So I started searching for land in 1980. I found this beautiful piece of property. There was no question I had all the water I needed, hundreds of springs everywhere, had a stream that flowed through the valley, and I would be able to create all of the ponds, 32 ponds that I wanted to build, the bridge crossings, and the waterfalls. This garden has a very old look about it. And as you said, you started in 1980, so this is a 33-year-old garden. It looks like it's been here for over 100 years. Most people that come to Gibbs Garden say, uh, did you inherit this from your parents? And of course, if you can find a piece of property as beautiful as this is, with all the natural formations that we had, uh, it makes such a difference because so many gardens that have been built have started as prairie land, and it takes 70 years to just get the garden to have enough age and, and, and maturity. Sure. Give us a quick overview of the garden. We actually have 16 garden venues. Three of these are feature gardens, and they serve as the three magnets that pull people from one point to the next. And within those three magnets, we've been able to develop the other 16 garden venues. So when you come to Gibbs Gardens, if you come every three weeks, you're gonna see something different in bloom. And it was designed that way from the first of March to the middle of December. So we like for people to come and see every bloom festival, and we have a calendar that shows the flower festivals and our music festivals. Jim, as we walk through the gardens, it's clear that you have a deep affinity for daffodils. Daffodils, definitely one of my favorites. This was my mother's favorite flower. All my grandmothers loved daffodils. Every spring, I would hear the first daffodil that came out. I said, oh, look at that beautiful daffodil. <laughs> it just ushers in spring. And the yellow color is so warm. Don't you just feel warmer in the, after winter? of cold weather, it's just wonderful to see daffodils. It is definitely yeah. a harbinger of spring, for sure. Oh, definitely. And you, you must have acres here. How many, how many bulbs would you estimate you have planted? We have over 50 acres of daffodils. I started planting daffodils in 1983, and every year I would plant anywhere from 100,000 to 250,000 wow. new bulbs. <laughs> so as you know, a daffodil divides and doubles. So with the daffodils, we have 50 acres of just hills and dales of daffodils. And of course, I use all the different varieties of daffodils also. Now, how long of a bloom period do you get out of the daffodils? Well, a lot of people don't understand this, but one of the reasons daffodils are so wonderful, you have actually four different periods of time. I call the early earlies, the ones that bloom in January and February. Then you have the early daffodils that start blooming the first two weeks of March for two weeks. Then you have the mid-season daffodils. They bloom usually for two weeks, and that will take you from the middle of March to the end of March. Then you have the late-blooming daffodils, and they're all fragrant, and those usually start blooming about the 1st of April to about the 15th of April. So we have an eight-week period. And people usually will go out and say, oh, I had no idea that I could get eight weeks of bloom out of my daffodils. So if you plan properly, you're going to be able to have from January, which is the first the daffodil is early sensation. It always blooms about the first of January, and it will bloom for about three weeks. Then after that, you've got February go, and you've got tete a tete that blooms the little dwarf miniature daffodil. This is a great example of the way that, that, that you're using daffodil bulbs on your property. You've got the, the little miniatures in the front, and then you've got 
an intermediate height and then, and then these taller ones. And, and especially in this more naturalized environment, as you're driving by or walking by, um, you're, you're also getting some really nice contrast in, in foliage color and then also in, in the height of the plant. Correct. I think the flowers themselves, the little miniatures, are so small. And then, as you just said, the next size, just to be a little large, and then you go to a, a larger flower and then a grand flower that's really like something like gigantic star that's just so large. They just knock your eyes out. But look at this. Here comes the sun. I mean, you've got a little bit of sun, but with these daffodils, you already had the sun because no matter how dreary it is, the yellow is warm and cheerful. But now look how much more cheerful it is because the sun has come out. So it makes a big difference, I think, to see the sunshine. What are your favorite bulbs? Well, of course, I have some favorites in each one of the groups. I like early sensation, Rheinfeld's early sensation, because it always blooms in January. Even if it's covered with snow, when the snow melts, it's fine. You, we cut them, bring them in the house. The next uh, group that I like are the February Gold. is a wonderful early blooming daffodil. Always blooms in February. And then I love the miniatures you mentioned, tete-a-tete, -tete, jet fire. Uh, these are some really nice little daffodils. They bloom a long time also because it's cooler then. Then I like to go into what I call an early season daffodil, which would be fortune which always performs well. Florists will usually grow that and cut it for flower arrangements. And then with Fortune, you've got St. Caverne, which is another nice one. You have uh, daffodils in the early group, uh, such as Ice Follies, mm -hmm. which is always a good performer. And then with the mid-season, I like to pick something like uh, Red Devon that you see here. And you can go in there with uh, some of the Fortissimo is, is a beautiful orange center with yellow. So that's a fabulous daffodil. And then you go into the late blooming daffodils and you have Salome, which is a pink, which is a real nice. And then you have all the fragrant daffodils that are late bloomers. So they bloom a long time. So uh, people love fragrance. Sir Winston Churchill, cheerfulness, uh, yellow cheerfulness uh, is another good one. Uh, geranium is another one. So. There are just so many. We have probably 76 varieties of daffodils, and every year I plant new varieties because I'm always finding a new variety that I like. Jim, this is certainly one of the most impressive plantings of daffodils I've ever seen. You've done a fantastic job here. Thank you. I typically think of daffodils as being a full sun kind of plant, but I would say the lion's share of the ones that you've planted are in what would otherwise be a full shade environment. Jim, what can you tell me about where we should plant different types of daffodils? Well, as you mentioned, all daffodils will grow in the sun. So if you have a sunny location, select any daffodil, it will grow. The ones you want to be careful about are the shade areas. You want to be sure if you have a lot of trees, you only plant early daffodils and what we call early mids. They're the mids that bloom early. Now, if you, if you have a lot of trees that are going to come out with leaves early, you want to put those daffodils in the shade that are early because you want them to come up, you want them to finish blooming and be able to turn yellow. The secret on a daffodil is do not cut the foliage when it's green. A lot of people do this. You gotta wait until the foliage turns yellow. Now, once it's turned yellow, the daffodil is saved. I have enough nutrients stored up to produce a flower for the next year. I also have been through my division. I have doubled in numbers. So that's the secret to the daffodil, making sure that you select the right kind. You probably have as much experience planting daffodils as anyone I've ever spoken with. What can you tell us about planting depth and if there's any kind of special soil preparation that we ought to do prior to planting bulbs? The depth for a daffodil is always determined by the size of the bulb. If you have, for example, a two inch bulb, you plant three times, so that would be six inches. So it's three times the size of the bulb. The other thing you want to do is make sure that you dig your hole deep enough 
And once you do that, you don't have to worry too much though because daffodils have tactical roots. A lot of people don't understand this. If you plant it a little too shallow, and I was worried about this because one year we planted too many bulbs and they were too shallow found out that they have tactical roots and the root system will pull the bulb to the desired depth it needs for your particular zone. So the next year it's going to be fine. So you don't have to worry much about it. Daffodils are just so easy because the deer don't eat the daffodils. They're toxic to deer. Uh, they're easy to grow. They repeat themselves every year. After about 10 years you may have to divide them then. but. Uh, there's just no problem with the daffodil. That's why everybody loves daffodils, and everybody has daffodils. You some years plant hundreds of thousands of daffodils, and I'm assuming you don't do that with a trowel or a bowl planter, do you? No, 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 no. <laughs> what we do with our daffodils is we actually uh, plant with power augers, and you can rent a power auger from a two rental place. You can also buy a little hand battery operated auger, and you can just put it down the ground and pull up. It's a lot easier. Planting uh, daffodils with bulb planters is very, very difficult. So I recommend that you always go out and get a little uh, power operated auger. Dig your holes with that and make it easy. Then daffodils can be fun. But so many people don't plant daffodils because of the labor involved. We can plant with three men working three augers, power augers, three people putting the bulb in, covering up 7,000 in one day. Wow. So when we plant 250,000 daf 250, daffodils in a fall season, we're moving along at 7,000 per day, but you can plant 100 or 150, 200 daffodils in 30 minutes with a power auger. So I do recommend that you do that. Are there certain blends of daffodils that you might recommend to us or some that, that you've put together that work particularly well? We have uh, certain blends, and of course, all of our collections have a third of early, a third of mid-season, and a third of late, so you're gonna get six weeks of bloom out of them. If you like yellows, we have a collection that has all yellow daffodils. If you like yellow and orange, that collection has yellow and orange daffodils. One mix has all fragrant daffodils. So I think it's important for you to select the kind of color that you like best and of course, if you want fragrance, you want to go to just a fragrance mix. That's great. For more information on growing daffodils and finding the daffodil mix that's right for your garden, visit us on the web at Gardensmart.com. One of the marks of a great garden is the gardener's attention to detail from a standpoint of having many, many things in bloom throughout the entire year. And as we come to Gibbs Gardens, if I came here six weeks from now, there'd be a whole nother range of things in bloom six weeks after that and so on and so forth through the rest of the year. This time of year, so we're in, you know, right now in, in late winter, early spring, there's not a whole lot of plants that are in bloom. What are some of the good companion plants for daffodils? Daffodils have a number of great companion plants. Uh, quince, which blooms first, is a wonderful companion plant. It comes in different colors. So you can have the white quince or you could have, uh, there's a red quince, which is nice. Uh, you could have their shades of different pinks and all. Another plant that would be nice would be forsythia, which I love. You've got yellow bells forsythia that bloom in February. Uh, they bloom for a long period of time, about three weeks, you see, because it's cooler then. Another plant that's great would be spirea which has the white flowers, they call it bridal wreath. And you have that, in fact, we have some here beginning to bloom with the forsythia, you can see the yellow bells. So all of these are nice companion plants. One of my favorite companion plants though, is paper bush, which is edgewarthia. And that's blooming with all the daffodils. That plant starts blooming with silver bells in December when nothing else is in bloom. Then you have many, many more silver bells in January, and oh, they're all over the plant in uh, February. Then in March, you have this wonderful fragrance that just takes over the plant, it blooms. It's fragrant all during the month of March, and then in April, the leaf comes out, and then it's a brilliant yellow in the fall of the year, so it's fabulous. So those are some of my favorites. The other thing I like most about companion plants they're vertical elements and they break up 
especially if you have a flat lot, it can be become very boring and monotonous. You add some vertical elements that come out of those daffodils, it makes the daffodil so much more showy. You definitely have some great examples of flowering trees that are all in bloom through the, the period that the daffodils are in flower. So early on, we're gonna have red buds, and then from there, you're gonna have flowering cherries, and then all of it crescendos into the magnificent bloom of the dogwoods. And, and they kind of track along the same time period as the earlies and the mid and the late blooming daffodils. And as you mentioned, these are excellent vertical elements. And it's a great way to, you know, to have you know, color up top and then with some of the, the shrubs that you mentioned and then you know, the, the daffodils along the floor. Then you have all the conifers, which are great. You have the uh, hollies with lots of red berries. They still have berries when the daffodils bloom. So there are just so many plants. And of course, we have hundreds of cherry trees, <laughs> as you mentioned, that flower with the daffodil. And there's nothing nicer than all of the beautiful dogwoods that, of course, are going to bloom also. They work so yeah, well together. They really do. Jim, winter and early spring is one of the best times to prune deciduous trees. And in fact, one of the most common questions that we get from our viewers is how do I prune crepe myrtles in particular? And of course, you've got some examples on your property of crepe myrtles that you've not pruned at all, some that you've done some intermediate type pruning on, and others that you've cut more severely. What instructs your decision as to how you're going to prune a crepe myrtle? Well, first of all, I like for crepe myrtle to be a little more in their natural form. Uh, I like to take out the inside limbs and let the plant grow up and feature the trunks. For example, this is a Natchez uh, crepe myrtle. It has beautiful cinnamon bark. So I want to make sure that you see this, the trunks. Want to make sure that the blooms that are up on the top get a lot of sunlight, which they do. Now all crepe myrtle bloom on new growth. So if you let the plant grow taller, it's going to put out so much new growth and that's what it'll bloom on. Same thing if you cut the plant down lower, that new growth that comes out, of course, will produce the uh, blooms. Now a lot of people are, need to think about where they're going to put the crepe myrtle in the landscape. For example, you have some miniature dwarf crepe myrtles that would work great in a landscape for a smaller house. You might have an intermediate crepe myrtle that needs to be used on a resident, or you could use this taller Natchez crepe myrtle. So everybody should think about the crepe myrtles and the size of the crepe myrtle. But we cut crepe myrtles back, for example, at the manor house to be able to see the view of the mountains. We cut them back enough to try to keep it as natural as possible, but I really prefer this to that. So everybody has to think about their location and select either a dwarf crepe myrtle, intermediate, or just the Lagerstromi indica, the taller crepe myrtle. That's great advice, Jim, and, and you're right. If you, if you make severe cuts where you go back into really, really thick wood, it looks quite unnatural, and it actually creates a very, very weak uh, branch structure and oftentimes those get broken up in rainstorms or snow um, and the worst thing is it doesn't look natural so I, I think agree. about the right plant for the right place it's great advice Jim thank you so much for sharing this amazing garden that you've built and for all the great tips you shared with us today it's been my pleasure thank you Thanks. Each week we travel the country north to south, east to west, visiting some of the most exciting gardens, as well as talking to industry horticulturalists about design principles, new plants, and also how you can be most successful with your home gardens. We also love answering your gardening questions, so visit us on the web at Gardensmart.com. Beautiful, colorful songbirds. At Pennington, we believe in helping wild birds not only survive, but thrive. Pennington Ultra Premium Wild Bird Feed has 100% real fruits, nuts, seeds, and grains. Bring the outdoors into your everyday life. Bass Pro Shops can outfit all your adventures, even those in your backyard. Bass Pro Shops, your adventure starts here.
Jaguar F-Pace. Spring is one of the most exciting times of the year, and today we visit a garden that does a particularly wonderful job of highlighting this season, as well as picking up some great tips on how you can get the most out of your spring garden. If you have questions about anything you've seen, visit us on the web at Gardensmart.com. And remember, even if you're a master gardener, there's always more to learn. So join us next week for more great tips and ideas as we garden smart.